Jesus gave a very good uh, parable when he said that a healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit and a diseased tree cannot bear good fruit. I've had the privilege of traveling a lot of churches and I can tell you this is a healthy church. And so if you're a guest and you're looking for a church, I'm pretty sure they're taking applications. Amen. This is a great place. If you have found yourself here and this is your first time, I'm, I welcome you. I know this church welcomes you. This is a good church. Can you just give yourselves a hand right now? And I know that feels weird to do that, but what a healthy church. Thank you, Brother Zuniga and pastoral team for raising up such a wonderful church. I want to invite you to 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. If you don't have a Bible, it should be on the screens. Before I read this text, when Israel went over to the promised land, God told them to set up stones so that in the future, when the children would look at those stones, they would ask, what do these stones mean? What are these here for? And the Bible commanded the fathers to tell them the story about Egypt, tell them the story about how God brought Israel into a promised land. That was the point of stones. It's unique because later in the New Testament, Peter would write an epistle and he would say, you yourselves are lively stones. And so if you don't know me, let me just tell you what this stone means today. I got filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost December 6, 1996, and my entire life changed. God introduced me to an amazing wife, and she has taught me so much about the church, and I know more and more about how to be a bride of Christ. I understand how to treat the bride of Christ because of my wife. He blessed us with a child, and we got to enjoy him, and the Lord took him home, and so I have deeply understood the comfort of God. I can take you to the day I was cleaning a car and me, my personality, I'm trying to constantly please God and fasting more and praying more and I can take you to the place. I'm going to just tell you what this stone means today. And in that car, God spoke to me and said, my grace required nothing of you. So I just want you to know what this stone means and I want to introduce you to the God that I have gotten well acquainted with. Is that okay? Amen. Amen. First John chapter two, verse one, my little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That word just means he stands in the way of us. He, gets, he stands where we're supposed to be standing. And so he is that for us, for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Oh, what good news, amen. Let me just talk to you a little bit today about the trial that changed history. And please, I hope that you know that these words are not just sermons for me. This sermon today means the absolute world to me because that's what this stone means. He met with me and showed me this and I wanna just show it to you. So would you lift up your hands today and would you be conformed into the image of Christ as God has been conforming me? Would you submit yourself, prayer warriors, would you pray? guests, would you just lift up your hands if you don't know the words to say? You could just tell God how much you want to get to know him. You may not know him that well, but can you just let him know, I want to know you a little bit more. I don't know much about you. All of it's appropriate right now. Just talk to him. That's the greatest level of faith is talking to an invisible God. Heavenly Father, I submit myself to you this morning. Lord, I am not anointed, but you are. So I ask that the oil you made in Gethsemane, you would pour on me. Lord, I trust you explicitly today that you will speak through me today because you love these people that much. I surrender myself completely wholly to you and I think it a great honor to be here to minister to your bride. Lord, help me to encourage, to exhort, to edify. Lord, help me to build up the body of Christ today as only I can do if you partner with me. So God, I surrender to you and fully trust that you will speak through me today. In your mighty, mighty name, we give you all glory and honor. Can we just clap our hands to him, the one who is worthy. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can be seated today. Court is not typically something we think of often, not unless we're in it or there is a court case that is making headlines, such as in April of 2022, we had a court case that was involving domestic abuse. In this particular course, our court made headlines in that particular time of year. 
The case went around the world in a nanosecond with just a simple hashtag. Some of you might remember it. It made pretty big news. It was hashtag justice for Johnny Depp. This hashtag would immediately garner 19 billion views across the internet. And for the next three months, the world sat with bated breath because we were curious what is going to be the ultimate outcome of the Depp versus Heard court case. In this three-month trial, Amber Heard's uh, lawyer, Elaine Bredhoff, would bring evidence against Johnny Depp. Her goal, her mission was to prosecute him of the crimes that he had been accused of by his ex-wife, Amber Heard. Simultaneously, Johnny Depp's lawyer, Camille Vasquez, would cross-examine witnesses. They would cross-examine the evidence that was brought against her client. And she also had a goal or an ambition. Her ambition was to advocate for Johnny Depp with the sole purpose of, I want you to be set free, and I want you to live out the rest of your life as if none of this ever happened. I want you, according to the law, to live as free as you did before these allegations came against you. The court ultimately settled that Johnny Depp's advocate had presented his case in a way that he was found not guilty. These and many, many court cases throughout history, you may be thinking of O.J. Simpson, you may be thinking of certain court cases that everyone sat with bated breath wanting to see what would happen. And because of a good advocate, those that were accused were set free. This case and many others echo into the spirit realm and you must understand how the Bible was structured and how those original authors used their languages. They would use certain words like advocate. That is not just a fancy KJV word. That is a literal law term in the Greek. The Greek word behind advocate in our opening text, it is the Greek word parakletos, which is used in court sessions talking about someone who advocates, someone who speaks on behalf of, someone who testifies. And the Bible doesn't just tell us about the advocate, but Peter says, be sober, be vigilant, your adversary, the devil. The word adversary is also a legal term. It is the Greek word antikados, and it is one who accuses, which is why in Revelations, he is simply called the accuser of the brethren. He is the one who gathers evidence. He is the one who brings it against us. And there is an overwhelming revelation when you read the Bible, and it's where many, if they don't grow in their faith, they'll stay at this elementary revelation. And that revelation is this. All of us are guilty. Every one of us have been accused, which is why Paul, a lawyer of his day, said in Romans 5, 12, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. He doesn't stop there, but in Romans 3, 10, he says, there's none righteous, not one. Romans 3, 23, all have sinned and have fell short of the glory of God. And this is where we begin, and this is a good place, contrary to what our culture may say to us, because godly grief leads us to repentance. There is a revelation that we must start at, and that is the revelation that we are sinners. We are born into sin. We have been shaped by iniquity. None of us are righteous. None of us are good. And the immature will live their life there, and it'll go from godly grief to demonic condemnation. You are to grow past that. That revelation of I'm a sinner brings us to the foot of, a, of an advocate and we look towards him and we begin to grow and though we know he has the power to judge us, rather than doing that, he says, forgive them. That revelation begins to pour over us and we begin to grow in it and this is reality of all of us are guilty is true. And here's the frustrating thing about it is our adversary knows we are guilty. And thus his name or his title, he has no name in the Hebrew Bible. His title, Brother Zuniga, is Satan. And it's the Hebrew word Satan, which means the slanderer or gossiper. That's not a name. It is a title given to him because that is what he does. When he finds those accused, what he does is slanders. He, he gossips against you. And we are born listening to his voice. We know his voice. We're well acquainted. Many of us, the adversary can take out an insurance policy on some of us because we'll destroy ourselves. 
Because all he has to do is lie. And we'll just repeat it. He has said things to us like not smart enough. Wrong family. Browser history. Inappropriate conduct. He has said these things to us. And though we have turned away or though we have gotten a revelation of God's goodness, it just plays on repeat. And this is where we get the doctrine of strongholds. It is simply a lie that has embedded itself into your prefrontal cortex. And it has worked its way down to your basal ganglia and it has become a memory that you cannot let go of. But God has given us the power to uproot things from the past. Why? Because God doesn't live in the present alone. He doesn't live in the future alone. He lives in all time, past, present, and future. So the moment a child of God says, that thing I did 10 years ago, God is the only one with the power to go back 10 years to the past. And he can go to the spot it happened and say, it's done. I've poured my blood on it because you asked me to. This is the power of God, and it pleases him to do such things. God is not only in your future. He is not only in this room currently, but you say the word, and he can go all the way back to where the memory happened, and he could say, I can fix that right now, but I need you to be transformed by the renewing of your mind, and that's going to take time, but here's what I'll do. I'll walk with you in the present and in the future until that image, that mindset, that stronghold has become conformed into my image. God walks with us. In Job 1, this lead prosecutor walks into a heavenly courtroom and he looks around and God asks him, from whence have you come? And listen, it's going to sound familiar because Peter says the same words. He says, I've been going up and down throughout the earth, walking up and down throughout it. And I have found one of your favorites. I found a little servant that, that claims he lives for you. But the only reason he does is because nothing bad ever happens to him. And God had more faith in Job than Job had in God because God looked at him and said, I see someone striving for me and I trust that they will not walk away because they know me. And so you do what you need to do, but don't take his life. And this prosecutor comes against Job and accuses him, lies on him, he'll walk away. Isn't it interesting that what the adversary said was a lie? He'll walk away from you. He will curse you to your face. And God looked at him and said, I'm going to show you what my people are made of because they know what I am. And he knows who I am, and he'll know that I won't leave him or forsake him. And so he'll walk with me even in trials because he'll have a revelation that I'm better than you. He'll know that my voice is better than your voice. Why would he spend a moment listening to you? Because you don't even advocate for him. He'll walk with an advocate because he'll know my voice is better. The adversary still does this very same thing, you must know, because 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, there's that word, the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He is a prosecutor. That's his job. That is what he does. But you must understand, he has no power. He has lies. He can speak things and you can hear them and sometimes he says it through people that are set out to hurt you that have been hurt by him. Sometimes people are his agents that say things to you and you can't let go of what somebody said to you. It's hard to forget about those words and it's not true. Sticks and stones may break my bones but words will not hurt me. That is the biggest lie that has ever been told because I don't know if words have ever been said about you but they hurt pretty bad, don't they? And it's those things that are hard to let go of. The adversary has perfected his craft. He brings evidence against all of us, and he screams at us. That adversary is good at his job. But the Bible says these words. Preach the gospel. The word gospel is good news. And we have to ask, if that word means good news, then what was the news to them? They have lived their entire lives being prosecuted with no one advocating for them. And Jesus would look at his 12 and he would say, you are my witnesses. I want you to go and tell the entire world what you just witnessed. Tell them about my cross where I died. And before I did, I said, forgive them for they know not what they do. Go and tell them that story. Go and tell them how they put me in the grave, but I couldn't stop 
stay there. And when I came back, I defeated the one who was prosecuting you. Go and tell this good news. The reason why it's called good news is because up until this point, we had no advocate. We didn't have anyone that was speaking on earth on our behalf. That was our job to hear from heaven and speak those words as intercessors. And God looked according to Zechariah and he said, I searched the world looking for an intercessor and I couldn't find one. So I will send forth my own right hand. And that is why Jesus, the Bible says, was standing at the right hand is because he is the intercessor. Intercessor means someone stands in between two people and advocates. Go and tell them now you have someone not just in heaven, but now you have my presence on earth as well. And anything that has been done, said, or committed, I can cover it because that is the good news. So go and testify about that. So let me testify to you today about some good news about who I was, but because he changed me, I'm not that anymore. Let me tell you about the young man who was laying in the floor with thoughts of suicide after my son passed away. And an adversary lied to me and said, if you take your life, you'll see your son in a moment. And then my advocate spoke in the same moment. And he said, but if you give me your life and lay it down for me, you'll get to have me and your son for eternity. So why would I listen to that voice when this voice speaks better words? I'm not just someone up here who is a preacher. I have witnessed his grace and I have brushed up against it and I have felt the overwhelming power of the grace of God that stretched forth to a failure and said, forgive him. He's called by my name. Use him. And the adversary said, don't use him. He keeps making mistakes. Don't anoint him because he keeps doing the same things. Meanwhile, my God just kept saying he's not guilty. He's not guilty. He's not guilty. Those thoughts in my mind that try to conjure themselves up from 10 years ago, the blood of Jesus washes over it and God says, stop thinking about those things. I covered it and I forgot it. I have all power and I am all knowing and I can use all my power to not know. You say the word and I will forget right now the thing that you think is plaguing you. So ask me how I know about this good news. It's not just something I've studied. It is something I have witnessed and then followed it up with study. So I come with experience and Bible for you today that I have been bought by the blood of Jesus and I have brushed up against his grace and he is not just as good as you have heard. He is better than you have heard. God is stronger than you have heard about. God is more gracious than you could imagine. I have witnessed it time and time again and so I come to a pulpit today to just merely be a witness. This is why John, in all of his wisdom, the one 17-year-old who stood at the foot of the cross and he looked at that man, Jesus, he heard the words firsthand, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What do you mean they don't know what they do? You, they are cursing you. They're telling you to call down angels, God. You could wipe them off the planet right now and you would be fully justified in doing so. Nevertheless, what John, the teenager, heard was forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And John would, I imagine, be so moved by those words of Jesus that he would write these words my little children I write these things unto you so that you don't sin but if anyone does sin you have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous the word righteous is the Hebrew word tzedakah which simply means one who does for someone else who cannot do for themselves if you go to Israel right now, you will find beggars on the side of the road and they're saying, Ani Sadiq, Ani Sadiq, someone be a sedaka, someone do sedaka, someone be righteous. Do for me what I cannot do for myself. Your righteousness is filthy rags. Our righteousness is not a list of do's or don'ts. Righteousness is when we look well upon the needs of others. That is what true righteousness is. And Jesus looked at us according to Paul's letter. And he said he saw our debt and it was stacked against us and no one was able to pay it off. And Jesus took that debt and nailed it to the cross. He said, you can't pay this off. You can't fast enough to forgive yourself. You can't pray enough to forgive yourself. You can't make your mind up to be born. How many in this room woke up and just said, you know, I think I'd like to be born today? That had nothing to do with you. That was the decision of your mother and father. 
And by their love, you came into the world graciously. Now that you're alive, you have decisions, but you had no power over your own birth. And so it is with the cross. What your decision is, is just like those men who hung Jesus from the cross. It was centurions who put him on a cross. Jesus submitted himself to the Roman Republic to hang him on that cross. That was man's job. It was Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus who took him off the cross and buried him. But no one on earth had the power of resurrection. It is always going to be man's job to come to the cross. That is our job. It is always man's job to go and be buried in baptism. But after that, it is God's good pleasure to do what only he can do, and that is the resurrection. I cannot give anyone in this room the Holy Ghost. There's not a minister in this place that can come and lay hands on you, and because of them, you get the Holy Ghost. You can't pray enough to get it. What you need to do is you need to have so much faith welling up that God wants to give it more than you want to get it, that God died to give it to every one of us, and he has enough. If he has power over death, I think he's got power to baptize somebody with the Spirit, don't you? I I believe that God's got more than enough power to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost, which is harder, resurrect from the dead or fill somebody who wants the Holy Ghost with the Holy Ghost. I would infinitely say it's much easier to fill some precious soul with the gift of the Holy Ghost today because that is his good pleasure. Let me show you the reality. Brother Zuniga, if you can come and stand up here. Can I get Brother Youth Pastor? Uh, can I get, I'm sorry, I didn't hear your name. What was it? Bill. So you're Bill. Was, was the other guy's name Billy? That's funny. He said he wanted to be like you when he grows up. It's like the same name. Yeah, it's like the same name. Can I get Brother Billy too? That would be amazing. I'm going to get some help. And brother, if I can get you to come up here too, that would be amazing. Let's see. I need a young guy. Some, I need a young guy that's not easily offended. That's you. All right. Excellent. If you get offended, it's on you now, okay? Because you said. What's your name? Damon. Damon. Okay. Damon, I want you to stand right here. Actually, I need you to not be offended. Youth pastors don't get easily offended. They're, they're pretty hardy. I was one for 12 years. All right. I need, Brother Zunig, if you can go up there. You guys, if you can go up on the platform too. And I need a young lady. Young, do you, are you easily offended? You look like you're easily embarrassed. I don't want to do that. No, you're not. You didn't even get mad, so let's go. All right. I want you to go up there too with them. All right, this is how this is working right now. This, I'm sorry. I almost clotheslined her. This is, Brother Damon is all of us. Okay, I want you to just put yourself where Damon is. And I want you to just sit for a moment with everything you have ever done. I don't want you thinking about it. Don't try to impress him. Paul said, do we go on justifying ourselves? Don't try to buy God with, well, God, I'm a good person. Well, God, I, I have fast a whole lot. God, I've given this much. Erase all of that because your righteousness is filthy rags. God is not purchased. Okay, He enjoys all that, so let's put it into its proper place. But you don't earn him because of that. So let's just put ourselves here and let's just go through a little stroll of our thoughts. Let's look at our version of love. We say we love people, but or let's be honest, are we saying those words to really get from somebody what we might want? Let's dig down to the motives. We say that we are faithful. We say that we love God. But when everything falls apart, can we still maintain that? Uh, can, can we really go through our thoughts? What would you do if someone hurts you today? We're not that good, are we? This is, this is the place where I get there pretty easy, Brother Zuniga. I, I can, I can, like I said, the devil can take out an insurance policy on me. I'm really good at killing myself. I know me. And that is, can be a positive or a negative, but I know myself so much that what sometimes happens is I don't feel like I'm even worthy to raise my hands in a church service. That might be some of you. Some of you may be like, God, I am God's gift to humanity. That's not me. I, I'm often like, I am a worm. I am the worst. Wherever you are, it doesn't matter on the right or the left. It doesn't matter. The bottom line is we're all filled with just sin and debauchery, aren't we? 
And here's the thing, we're born in sin, so we're born facing an adversary, and he knows this about us. And so what he does is he just says, you say you love him, but I've seen, I've seen your screen time. You raise your hands higher than anybody else, but you have yet to pick up the Bible one time this week. You have shopped on Amazon far more than you have sought his face. You have killed everybody but smiled to their face when you were around them. You have talked about everyone and tore them apart. You're just as bad as I am. You're just as much a gossiper. Here, why don't you hold the title, Satan, because you gossip just as much as I do. This is what he tells us. And we're weighed down with all this revelation. And he's constantly berating us. He may tell us, you say you want to be a minister, but I've seen your search history. Just like David, you mess up with windows too. I, I've looked at, ma'am, I've seen you. Ladies, y'all some vicious people, y'all. Maybe it was just young people. I don't know. Maybe, maybe y'all, y'all grow up, but... Young ladies tear each other apart. And then at youth events, they're like, how are you doing? This is us. This is who we are. And he knows that. And so we get bogged down more and more, and we're being conformed into his voice. But something beautiful happened. God Almighty saw this, and he waited. He gave us an entire Old Testament, not because he was, he was delaying, God gave us an entire Old Testament filled up with failures to show us that me and you can't do this. That's the point of the Old Testament. Go through the list of any of them. There's not one person in the Old Testament that executed it perfectly. They were foreshadows of Christ, the good moments, but all of them failed. And the reason why is because God's infinite wisdom knew if I go right outside this garden and put up a cross and die on it your arrogance will say you could have done it without me so what I'll do is I'll give an entire Old Testament to show you what you're capable of by yourself so that when I come everyone will know we need you this is why the prophet said God we need you to take our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh and not only that we need to put your spirit inside of us because we're not capable of doing this and so God finally after all of that time the Bible says and at an appointed time God sent his son and he came down here why why a son why use that language because we are sons and we forgot how to do it. And so the father himself came down here as a son to show us what sonship would look like. And the first order of business is the father goes through himself as son into this earth. He goes into the Jordan River and the voice from above says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hold on. Jesus, you haven't done anything yet. You haven't cast out a devil. You haven't fasted 40 days. You haven't done any. You haven't multiplied bread. What are you pleased with? God is showing us sonship in this moment because we completely forgot what it would look like. And so he had to become a son to show us what sonship would be like. Jesus, who had no resume, pleased the Father. And the first thing the slanderer said was, let me take you to court here in this wilderness. If thou be a son, turn that stone into bread. He always tempts us with performance. You're not really his unless you've got a resume of some stuff that you can do. I will only legitimize you as a son if you can turn stones into bread, if you can do some miraculous feat in Jesus, in all of his God-like authority. He walked past him and just quoted scripture the entire time. He's quoting him Deuteronomy over and over again because he is the word. He wanted to show us by becoming a son what we would be like when we became sons. And I testify to you loud and clear, your resume means nothing. And the adversary is always going to tempt you with performance. It is not about my performance. It's about being pleasing to the Father while I was... Before I was even filled with the Holy Ghost, he said, you turn to me and I will see your obedience and that's what will please me. My grace requires nothing from you. You come to me and I will change you. You had no choice over birth. You didn't get to decide. He made the decision. He initiated the cross. He initiated all of this. And so what he did is he came down here and he spake better words than those of the adversary. And as he began to preach, as he began to testify, these people like Damon here, we began to turn to him and we said, you know what?
what? That sounds a whole lot better than what you've been saying. I'll take that anytime. Jesus didn't just stop there. He looked at Damon and he said, Damon, come on behind me. No, not anymore. I've come down here to give you peace. I don't want you hearing that anymore. And he stood in our place as an intercessor. And here's the good news. The Bible says he ever liveth to make intercession on behalf of his people. He came in and when the adversary said, I've seen your search history. All he knows is not guilty. I've seen your search history. Not guilty. I've seen your past. Not guilty. I've seen your parents that are incarcerated. Not guilty. I watched your mom when she went through all that trouble and generational curses come to you. Not guilty. I have all the power to break every curse is what heaven will say. I have the power in my name and in my blood. There is nothing that can stand near me, not leprosy, just my mere presence alone. When I walk into an atmosphere, the adversary bows to me. He's going to bow from now on. He has no power. I've come to take all of that from him. He stands in your place your job is to do one crazy thing confess and this is where we get messed up in church because we're terrible at altars father forgive me for I'm a sinner that's not confession God I'm addicted to pornography <laughs> that's when you start showing the blood that's those that's those bloody altars oh god i'm a gossiper god i have abused everyone god i have gossiped about everybody i'm a hypocrite say the ugly thing say the thing that embarrasses you with hands thrown up and you say god i am a liar i am addicted to everything God, I can't take anything serious. I'm always looking for the next big thing. God, I'm addicted to buying things so that I can purchase some free moments of non-guilt. God, I am the worst. Everything he said is true. Thank you. If you will confess your sins, I am faithful and just to forgive you all of your sins. Now that you have confessed, he can no longer see you. So you come behind me and I'll stand and guard you. You have now gone beyond my blood. He cannot pass my blood now. He cannot do anything to you. You abide under the shadow of the Almighty now. You are hidden in Christ. You have gone behind my cross. There is nothing. He cannot come near you. It's up to you. If you want to go on the other side of me, you, can, you have free will. But I recommend you stay behind me and you will because you'll know how good I am. You'll see how loving I am, how kind I am, how faithful I am, how much peace I give. You'll know everything about me, and you won't want to leave. And as you grow in me, you'll see that his voice will never compare. Christ came to defeat sin. This is still the gospel. This is still the good news. Acts 2.38 is not the gospel. Acts 2.38 is my response to that gospel. And the response is good. And what do we need to do? Turn around. Repent. Be baptized. You know what happens when you get baptized? Same thing happened to Jesus. We get put down into the land of the dead where these guys live. And Jesus went down there and took the keys. When you get baptized in the spirit realm, you are being buried. And all of hell comes after you and says, we got another one. He died. And all of a sudden, they hear a name. And when the name of Jesus is pronounced over you, you come out of a grave. And when you come out of that grave, they stop and they say, we cannot go near them for they have been put under the name of Jesus and they have resurrected with with new life. We are not just passionate about baptism because it's some little creed that the church does. We believe that we really put you down with him and we pull you out in the name and none of them can come near you ever again. You have been resurrected into a new life. Behold, all things have passed away and old things have become new. You have resurrected with a new life. Here's the power of it, though. If this doesn't do it for you, the Bible says we're compassed by so great a cloud of witnesses. And the word witnesses is also a legal term. And so why don't we ask some heavenly entourage for a moment if this checks out. So 
David, why don't you tell us what you know about all of this court stuff? David stands as witness at this moment right here at 11.25 a.m., and he stands in every church service, every prayer meeting, every Monday night Bible study, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and he stands and he says these words, I blew it. I wrote a psalm that I would not look upon a virgin. And then I looked at Bathsheba. I knew better. I had a psalm written about it, and I broke my own covenant to God. I should have been wiped off this planet. According to the law, I should have been stoned to death. For some reason, all I knew to do was not blame Bathsheba. I didn't want to blame her husband. I didn't bl blame the time of war. I went and I wrote Psalm 51 against you. And you only, O oh Lord, have I sinned. Cast me not out from before thy presence. In burnt offerings and sacrifices, you do not delight. If you did, I would, I would kill a thousand animals for this forgiveness. But I see now what it is you really wanted. You wanted a broken heart and a contrite spirit. And I've got that because I am so broken about my sin that I committed with Bathsheba. But God, would you blot out my transgressions? Would you purge me clean with hyssop? Would you make me clean? He got new covenant grace before it was even allowed. He got that before there was a cross. How much more so do you think you have access to it? And that David stands as testimony in a courtroom all across the world right now. He's saying he can forgive you. He can forgive you. He can forgive you. Meanwhile, he's saying forgiven, forgiven. And all of heaven testifies. But maybe that doesn't do it for you. Let's look at a guy in the New Testament. Peter, why don't you come and tell us what you know? Peter would look at us and say, I was a minister. I was handpicked by him. I was in every prayer meeting. I was at every church service. I was the one breaking bread. I was the one who was up there washing his feet. I did it all. And in the moment he needed me most, I blew it. I walked away from him. For some reason, though, after his resurrection, he came and found me. Just like Adam and Eve who failed and they heard the voice of God blowing in the wind, God still looks for failures. And he came and found me, and he called me back and let me preach Acts. And I believe Jesus would testify with him and say, no one can preach it better, Peter, because you understood it best. You understood my forgiveness, and so you would preach it with the utmost passion, not because you're special, not because you were with me in every prayer meeting. None of that gave you access. You saw my passion. You saw my love, and that's what gives you access to preach this gospel. But is it just for men? There's neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female, because he come and did it for Mary as well, who was caught in the act of adultery. And what does Jesus do? He stands between her and her accusers. He hits his knee, draws a line in the sand, and looks at her accuser and says, those of you who have no sin, go ahead, cast that first stone. But I, the living stone, the cornerstone, I stand as witness. Don't you dare throw a stone. If you do, you'll hit me first because she is not going to get any of that as long as I'm here. And she stood between them. But watch what Jesus does. He also turned and said, now go and sin no more now that you've seen my amazing grace. Now that you know how good I am, testify. Tell everybody about me. You have more than enough witnesses to testify. You've got got them from the past. You have me in the present. You have other men and women in this room who could testify. But if that doesn't do it for you, musicians get ready. If that doesn't do it for you, there's one last piece of evidence in the courtroom. The reality is we did it. We can ask for forgiveness, but what about this back here that I still did? I I confess, yes, I've repented, I'm turning, I want to live for you, but I still abused my spouse. I still was addicted. The damage has been done. And it's my sin ever stands before me, Dave said. What do I do? The most beautiful part about this whole equation is not just the witnesses, not just that God came down to the earth, but God put on flesh that could bleed. And it's not just Jewish blood. Because according to Matthew 1, he's got Gentiles in his genealogy. And not good ones. Harlots. 
in the bloodline of Jesus, there was failure. But he's God. In the God blood, abolishes the sinful blood. And he goes to that cross and blood starts pouring down from him. And when you say the word, he puts his blood on whatever happened back here. He contaminates the crime scene so that it's no longer your fingerprints that are there. So this guy who can sniff it out and he goes and looks, here's what I'll do. I'll, you go ahead and preach and I'll, I'll resurrect all that junk you've done. You better just sit on a pew and do nothing because the second you do something, I'm going to resurrect all that stuff that you did and you're going to go back through that downward spiral of condemnation you went down. Don't you dare do a thing. What you need to do is you need to testify. No, the blood of Jesus covered that whole crime scene. It's not there. We have more faith in Johnny Cochran than we do in the blood of Jesus. We have more faith in a good lawyer than the one who's never lost a court case. Ministers, hear me. There is no other message. There's no better message. There's nothing new we need to preach. The blood is still the message. Because when I preach this blood, I have been interceding this whole sermon in English through Scripture. And I have been commanding the blood to be poured on an area of your life. And so I stand here with spiritual authority and I tell anyone in this room, I don't care if you've been living for God for 20 years. I know what it's like to live for God all your life and still have junk back there and not have a revelation of how powerful His blood is. So if you are dealing with any of that stuff, I want you to see the blood of Jesus washing across all of it. Abide it. It is gone. It is no more remembered in the heavenly realms. He can bring it up, but you need to testify to him today and say, no, the blood covered that. It is no longer real in my life. That no longer happened according to the heavenly realm. I want us to stand, and before you come to this altar, I want to just ask some questions. Altar workers, if you can come up here and get ready to pray. If y'all are already up here, thank y'all. Damon, thank you. Sit down. If you have never been baptized in the name of Jesus, it is not just a sacrament. It's not just a Pentecostal liturgy. It's none of that. It's, it is truly something spiritual. It's an actual burial. If you have never been baptized in his name, why do why do you keep emphasizing his name? Remember I said that the adversary has no name? You remember that? Satan's not a name. Lucifer's not a name. That's a Latin word that never got translated over into the English. It means son of the morning. Devil, none of those are names. I asked a professor in college, I said, how come he has no name? He looked at me like I didn't have two brain cells to rub together. He said, Aaron, he's not worthy of a name. I said, but he's a father of lies, right? He said, yes. I said, he's a son of perdition, right? He said, yes. I said, he's an evil spirit, right? He said, yes. He said, but those are titles. I said, why don't you give him a name in Hebrew culture? He said, because when we want to strip you of dignity in our culture, we don't give you a name. And I said, so if I didn't baptize in Jesus' name, what is that like? He said, it would be tantamount to putting God into the same category as a devil. He said, because he is worthy of a name and his name is above every name. So when you baptize in the name, the one who has no name recognizes it. And when you go under in that name, the one who has been stripped of that dignity backs off and says, we can no longer touch them. They are now under the protection of the name of Jesus. We know that name, we know him. So if you have never experienced that today, we invite you. We don't make you. We won't push you. We won't prod you. We invite you because I want to represent the gentleman today that is Christ. He is saying, come, come. I want you to come under my name. If you've never been filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking in other tongues. Why tongues? Go throughout all of the Bible. 
when it says they heard the voice of God blowing in the cool of the day, the word cool of the day there is wind. And the word voice is the Hebrew word kolot, it's languages. When Adam and Eve failed, they heard a language blowing in the wind. That's the actual Hebrew translation. And so when you go to Acts 2, who's up there? 120 failures. Peter, one of them. And as they were praying, a rushing mighty wind came through that place as God was seeking out failures again. The reason why he's doing that is because God breathed life into Adam. And when Adam went out of the garden, he spiritually died. And so in that upper room were 120 dead men. And God breathed life back into them. And the way they knew was by the sound of the wind, according to John 3. You'll know the Spirit by the sound you hear thereof. You're going to know it. And when they began to speak in other tongues, God was breathing back into failures. And they became spiritually alive. And so if you have died spiritually, if you have never been reborn of the water and the spirit I want to invite you if you are here today and you've been battling condemnation I want you to come up here if you've been living for God and you're getting a new revelation of his blood I want you to come up here I want to invite all of us as a family to these altars and I want you to throw your hands up when you get to these altars right now I want you to begin to make your way as you come up here I want you to throw those hands up intercessors I want you to begin to intercede this isn't just for people who don't have the Holy Ghost this is for the whole family I want you to get a true revelation of the power of his name, the power of his blood, the power of witnesses, the power of God's forgiveness. I want you to see it new today, and I want that to be the bedrock that you build your faith off of. I want you to build your faith off of the goodness of God, off of the grace of God, off of the forgiveness of God. As you raise those hands. You're not buying him with many prayers. You don't have to heap up prayers to him. Here's what I want you to do. I just want you to let him know, God, I'm tired of living this way. I want you more. It don't have to be a pretty fancy prayer. You don't have to know all the right words. All you have to have is desire. God, I want you more than I have been wanting all of this. God, I want you. Begin to lift up those voices all across this room. Prayer warriors, stand in the gap on behalf of people that have been bound by addictions. Begin to pray because what you're doing is you're joining with Jesus who intercedes. And you're releasing into this room spiritual authority through your prayers. So saints of God, pray in the Spirit. Yes, lift those hands up. Nobody's going to shake you. Nobody's going to do anything weird to you. They're just going to come and pray with you as former failures themselves.